my agenda is to encourage digital literacy. So the graphical user interface might normally obfuscate code in the interest of making these tools more accessible. I'm using that same sort of interface to augment the code so that you're forced to play with code and learn by messing with that. So I made the whole tool I meant to introduce people to 3JS and WebGL that's modeled after learning by copying and pasting. My name is Nick Breeze, and I'm a new media artist slash educator based in Chicago, Illinois. I'm going to be walking you through this tool that I built, which lets you play with and make interactive and generative 3D animations in the browser using 3JS, which is a library built on WebGL. It started from my frustration with personally experimenting with this stuff because I'm a new media artist and I work in this experimental copy-paste tinkering way. And like the, the WebGL stuff and to some extent even the 3JS library wasn't so conducive to that kind of practice. So I started to build a system that would just let me play with this code a bit more and then figure it worth packaging in such a way that other folks can play with it. So what it does is bridge the gaps for folks that are a bit more sort of experimental new media, digital art minded. Again, these kinds of folks that like experiment, copy and paste, tinker with stuff and learn this way. Uh, and these tools that have been developed by like the open source community by programmers and developers. And the reason for doing that is digital literacy. So it's, it's organized in such a way that gets folks to look at code and to play with code rather than hiding this stuff. So we're gonna walk through it. And as a basic example, we'll make like a Campbell soup can. The first step, that sort of like graphical code interface. So on the right side, you have like menus with sliders and buttons, sort of familiar interface. On the left, you have the code that is rendered by using the interface. So you can't interact with the code here, you interact with the GUI. So like you've got a menu here where you pick a shape. So we'll pick a, a cylinder since we're going to make a soup can. And so as soon as you pick a cylinder, you notice that like that first line changes from three dot cube geometry to three dot cylinder geometry. So that's kind of like your first clue of like what that, what that line does. And then there's a bunch of numbers here, right? Which correspond to the geometry. And we've got sliders here that says radius top, radius bottom, height, and radius segments. So if I move the height slider, uh, you can see the, the geometry changing in real time, but also you notice like this number changing. So that's kind of like the clue of like, okay, that's what that number does. It controls the, the height, which you might not know just by looking at it. But that's how you kind of start to learn this stuff. Then you've got a little menu for the different materials. So we'll go with just like the basic material. There's a checkbox here to give it a texture and there's like a drop down list. So when you click on the texture box, you've got a menu where you can choose from some preloaded textures or you could just upload your own texture. So I've preloaded the Campbell Soup texture, so I'm just going to load it up. And then you move on to the next step, which is the editor. And so this is a basic sort of 3JS template, which is made up of two functions, a setup function and a draw function. So as soon as I copied that code in from the, from the last step, the Campbell Soup can, it sort of like showed up there, kind of like vaguely in the background. And that's because the editor is layered over your final sketch, your final project. And there's a button up in the corner that says hide code that, that lets you toggle that on and off. So if you click it, you can see what the sketch is going to look like when you finish and you share it. And if you toggle it again, the code comes back up. Another section in this top right hand corner called snippets. And so this is sort of a library of different code snippets that we can start to collage by copying and pasting them in. So we can start with this first one that just says rotate mesh, which as the name implies, will rotate our mesh. And it just takes you to the little code snippet. And there's some like, all the snippets have little instructions just in case. So it says to rotate the mesh, add the code below to your draw function. So we'll copy that. I'm going to paste it into the draw as dictated by the instructions. And as soon as I pasted it, you can kind of see the can rotating. Again, we can hide the code and get a better look of Camel Soup can. So the way that the, that the snippets work, it's kind of they, it starts off with the simplest snippet and then they kind of like build off each other as they go down. But we can skip down to this one doing 500 Campbell Soup cans. Since this is like a 3D environment, 
we have got objects, but we've also got a camera. So we can move the objects, or we could also move the camera. That's something we want to do. So one snippet says swing camera or mesh. And this is just like literally one line to swing your camera around. And it says add that to your draw function. There you go. Anytime you see numbers, you want to mess around with those numbers. So I might just mess around with the numbers on the camera swing effect. And if I make this one bigger, my, my swing is a bit more pronounced. Again, copying this and just replacing that line 27 like it says. Yeah, so now we're getting, now it looks like net art. <laughs> so then the last step of the thing would just be to like archive it, right, to save it. And you've also got this little menu where you can share. So like as, as you share your sketch, folks can still mess with your sketch and they can save that as their own like remix or iteration or like fork as they call it in like open source. Copying is, in my opinion, how creativity works. And to some extent, it's how digital technology works. I mean, literally everything is a copy, RAM and memory. Interfaces and software, they all have kind of an embedded ideology. The folks that make this stuff embed and to some extent impose their politics on these systems and therefore on you. For specific examples, a text editor versus a PDF, a tiny bit of politics embedded in this thing, where it's just like, no, you shouldn't be able to copy this, versus another piece of software that says, no, you shouldn't be able to copy this. The effect of recognizing those politics, whatever they are, just means you can choose to like subscribe to those ideas or, or not. So if you disagree with one paradigm, you recognize that it is a paradigm, and you can look for software or tools or a computer or a completely you know, scenario that, that more reflects your, your worldview.